Hey everyone, well, welcome to the March edition of the Ag Economic Dialogue session. Thank you all for joining us and uh, we're glad you were able to make the session today or watch us on our YouTube video. So joining today, we've stepped outside of our normal uh, speaker list. We've reached out to a colleague down in Nebraska and Brad Lubin is gonna give a some insight into what the farm bill situation is looking like now, and maybe a little bit of, hey, pay attention to this, that, or the other. So, Brad, I will let you take it over and uh, you can share screen. Uh, questions during your presentation, or would you prefer they wait? I think we can uh, talk as we go along, and, and questions are, are welcome whenever. So, okay, very good. So, you guys un unmute your microphones if you have questions or type them into the chat. And we'll try to get those to Brad as we go through. So with that, Brad, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, thank you also, uh, uh, Matt, uh, for the initial contact and, and invitation. Appreciate the opportunity to, to join you and to talk uh, to you from Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, it is, uh, I could complain about it being cold down here. I could complain about there being snow on the ground today, um, but I, I know who I'm talking to and I can't complain relative to what uh, you guys have worked through this winter as well. So uh, so I'll stop with that. Other than mentioning it did hit 70 degrees here on Tuesday. So I think spring is on the way, just not yet this weekend. Uh, I've been asked to join and, and talk about the farm bill and, and what we see ahead. Uh, I've uh, focused on farm policy my entire career. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, an original Nebraska native and, and Nebraska alum uh, with a bachelor's and master's degree here, but worked now more than 30 years total, uh, part in Illinois, part in at Kansas State, and uh, now for the last 17 plus years here back home in Nebraska. I focus on farm policy issues. Uh, I'm an extension policy specialist here in the Ag Econ Department. I'm also director of what's called the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center which is a USDA funded center that in turn runs a regional grants program for producer focused risk management education. Uh, uh, Heather and, and others uh, have uh, been participants in or, or uh, directors in some of those funded projects over time as well. So it's a privilege to get to, to collaborate with you today on, on this uh, other topic of farm policy. So I wanna focus on, on a farm bill discussion uh, I want to sort of introduce it as, remember this very broad uh, scope of issues that really get talked about in the Farm Bill. These were the 12 titles of the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, and it's a, re it's a reminder that this is a complex picture. It's not just about the farm. It's also not just about food, although that will become a very critical part of the discussion. Uh, but clearly, it's a, it's a big uh, task ahead of us to talk about a new Farm Bill that's supposed to be due uh, here by September of this year. If we focus on what's in the Farm Bill and we focus on what it means for producers, it's often easy to focus on Title I and Title XI, commodity programs and crop insurance programs, because that's what we fundamentally see as the safety net uh, for producers. But a little bit of perspective on where we've been as we write different Farm Bills and a little bit of perspective on where we're going uh, with, uh, with prices or with uh, ag economic outlook offers us a perspective on why the issues are coming up that, that we face. If you think about farm bills being a product of their times, then every farm bill is written in a unique time period. And in this case, a unique farm income outlook. Oh, let me back up, went one step too far. Uh, I could go back in the 30 plus years of farm legislation that I've tried to follow, and I could describe every farm bill really as being responding to its times. Most recently, the 2018 Farm Bill was written during a down cycle when there was a focus on trying to maintain the safety net amid lower prices and lower farm incomes. Since 2018, however, we've seen so much in the way of ad hoc uh, decisions, trade assistance, and then COVID relief and emergency programs that the role of farm programs is increasingly a little more challenging to try and decipher. Uh, and we're trying to write a new farm bill now in 2023 when we're looking at very strong farm incomes, at least uh, statistically speaking. Record farm incomes projected for the United States in 2022 
off of or after a record in 2021. Now we fall back in 2023 as prices uh, uh, pull back, but uh, fundamentally we're still talking about a very strong farm income, at least historically speaking. What kind of farm bill that gives us is a very different picture than what we write when we're in the midst of a, of a downturn. Now, it's not all roses here. Uh, we do see higher prices and higher crop receipts, but we also saw substantially higher production expenses. And that's led producers to simultaneously talk about, well, prices are higher, but so are expenses, which means margins are still getting squeezed, which means we still face risk. And perhaps we face risk that hits us long before the, the existing safety net would kick in. And that's a real economic question and challenge that we see here at the moment. I look at just the corn price as an example. The corn price is there, the, the black line on the chart, all the way back to 2004. The, the green line is the loan rate, the red line is the target price or the reference price as it's known. Uh, when corn prices shoot up, there's not much safety in that price-based safety net. That was fundamentally the emphasis that led us towards a revenue-based safety net originally in the 2008 Farm Bill, repeated in the 14 and the 18 Farm Bills. Now here we are in 2023, we have prices that are up dramatically, uh, pulling back from record levels set for the 2022 crop year, projections for the 23 crop year closer to 570 or 560, but still a long ways away from that 370 reference price which has led us to say, well, what do we do to the safety net? Some calls are to try and raise reference prices, raise them up to a level that would help protect more of the downside risk. Some calls are pointing to those higher production expenses and saying, let's try and work at margin instead of working just at, at reference price. Uh, margin instead of price will help protect us from, uh, from those higher costs as well. Well, those are all complex op challenges and opportunities. Most dramatically perhaps anything that raises that safety net in one form or another costs money and finding money to write a new uh, farm bill or to write additions to the farm bill will be one of the fundamental challenges this year. Now I paint the picture ahead here through 2028. One thing worth noting is that the existing farm has a flexible, uh, a flexible provision in the target price or that reference price. It will move up with five-year Olympic average prices. Uh, and thus, we have now had enough years of higher prices that starting next year for the 24 crop, we would actually have a higher reference price, somewhere around 398. All right, better than 370, but not substantially uh, an improvement if you're worried about uh, price risk from five and six dollar levels on down. Uh, now, you also see a price projection in there that returns us to the mid four to five dollar price range. The reality is that's a long run projection. Uh, if I borrow USDA's Ag Outlook or baseline projections for those price estimates. I'm not particularly confident in them. I'm not trying to uh, project them myself. Uh, but it's a reality that says if we return to a longer run average price, then these safety nets become very relevant again uh, relatively quickly. Now that's the corn price safety net. There's also the revenue safety net. The revenue safety net does move more with that average. It's a five-year Olympic average price times 86% uh, times, times the five-year Olympic average yield. So on this same price chart, I put the five-year Olympic average price in blue, 86% uh, of that five-year Olympic average price in the dashed line. And effectively that's where the ARC program kicks in if you uh, reach trend yields or if you reach uh, average yields. Uh, so it's sort of comparing the, the price effective component of ARC versus the price component of PLC. ARC does better when prices are higher because PLC doesn't adjust up enough. ARC adjusts up uh, at least in response to those higher prices. And if we're coming off of higher prices, then uh, then the guarantee in ARC looks stronger than uh, than uh, relative to where prices are going. It's not much protection at the present time. In fact, total payments under ARC and PLC are dang near dwindling to zero. Uh, but at least the picture ahead says it's still a relevant safety. 
if I try and give you some exact pictures or exact numbers for 2023, this isn't yet the new farm bill. This is the last year of the existing farm bill. We're already set for where we're going. We have effective reference prices. Those are, those are set in the legislation. We have the ARC benchmark price, which is the five-year Olympic average price. And we have projected prices. This is USDA's current uh, projections as of their, their baseline numbers published in February. Uh, if we're projecting a 560 price for corn against a 370 reference price, then there is simply no opportunity, no possibility that the PLC program would kick in. It would take a 34% price loss before that safety net would kick in. That's the worry that there's a substantial loss before any sort of uh, protection from the safety net would kick in. Now go all the way over to the far chart, it would take a 39% revenue loss for the ARC program to kick in. Uh, so it takes an even bigger revenue loss than it does a price loss for the ARC program to kick in. Uh, the chances that we have a 39% revenue loss versus the chances we have a 34% price loss, it's possible that revenue wins that equation, but they're both very, very small probabilities. Uh, there's just not much safety in that safety net today. Some of the reasons for the calls for the new farm bill debate that we've seen. Now, I'm, as I said, I'm not confident enough to predict a farm price uh, forecast here, um, but I just wanna remind you how difficult it is to try and predict a, a price forecast here. I've put the same uh, corn prices on the chart uh, and I've compared it to various baseline forecasts published over time. In 2005, when corn prices were around two bucks, USDA's baseline projections said, maybe you get from two to 250 over the next 10 years. And of course we saw the commodity boom take off and got over four uh, before we backed off a bit, before we actually ultimately spiked up around seven uh, in the midst of the commodity boom and the 2012 drought. Well, coming off of the drought in 13, USDA's baseline said, well, we're obviously not gonna stick around those record levels, but we're gonna fall back to something between four and $5. And then we fell back to something between three and four. Uh, ultimately here about 2019, 2020, uh, 2021, uh, the projections are, well, we're at higher levels now, but those are not likely to last. And if I look at the 2023 projections uh, published by USDA and, and now published by the Congressional Budget Office, those projections aren't expected to last. Those higher prices look like they trend back toward low $4 uh, price levels. Now, the first sort of conclusion from this chart is if we're really trending back towards those longer run price levels at lower levels, suddenly the safety net really matters again. It just doesn't help right now for, for very much of the, of the risk. The other conclusion of this chart could be that economists are very good at drawing straight lines. Uh, we really don't have uh, the ability to predict something out of the ordinary. And we've seen everything but the ordinary over the last four to five years. Uh, so, uh, so the reality is we're predicting a return to longer run averages, barring some shocks in the marketplace. And if we do, then the relevance of the safety net becomes more and more important. Now, that's the commodity program sort of economics that are setting, up, setting us up for the discussion we have today. If I look back a couple farm bills to 2014, I can talk a little bit about commodity program politics. And uh, this is to credit uh, a colleague of ours, Dr. Keith Coble, Mississippi State University, who uh, served uh, uh, some temporary time on Capitol Hill as the 14 bill was being written and really came away with these observations that he, he write, helped uh, put into the description of what happened in the 14 farm bill. The real conclusion here, if you just look at the first couple rows, uh, when prices were higher and the traditional price safety net looked less and less relevant, there's lots of interest in trying to change how the program works. And there was interest in moving towards revenue instead of loss, particularly in corn and soybean country, where we're at. Uh, corn and soybean producers and corn and soybean organizations looked at revenue as a way to ramp up the safety net as opposed to the price safety net that was stuck at lower levels. Uh, 
It helped that we're already good consumers of crop insurance. It helped that we have that protection to, to, uh, to help um, you know, stop against the, the deep losses. So it was really that continual shallow loss in, in sort of the deductible portion uh, that we had most, uh, most attention to. And that's where the revenue safety net of ARC really began to play a role. Compare that to the other commodities, uh, particularly the Southern commodities of rice and peanuts uh, and, and cotton, I would say, but cotton had to make other changes for trade reasons. But the Southern commodities of rice and peanuts largely said, you know, we're very happy with the traditional price safety net. In part, their prices had not risen in those, in the run up to 14, the way that corn and soybeans had. And thus there was a large push to sort of stick with what worked and uh, payments were bigger and expectations of, of relevance of a price safety net continued to be much bigger. That sort of revenue versus price mentality uh, existed in 14, it still exists today. We still fundamentally see a big divide between what kind of risk are we trying to protect uh, and what kind of support levels do we need to protect. Now that's a story from 2014. There's other players in 2014 that are still around here for the 2023 debate as well. It's not just the commodity folks that drive the debate, it's also the conservation and environmental folks. And at the time there were the, what I would call the conservation, conservationists and the environmentalists. And the conservationists maybe were willing to make a deal, they were the dealers. Uh, conservationists fought for conservation compliance tied to crop insurance. Uh, they, they were willing to go along with support for crop insurance as long as they could expand the role of conservation compliance. Some of the environmentalists in the room or the no dealers really sought to reduce both commodity programs and crop insurance as a way to reduce uh, funding in those areas as a way to potentially increase funding in the environmental area. Uh, you can see also some of the other players on, on the food side uh, the Tea Party heritage faction, as Keith described, uh, we could think of the right wing, uh, the far right wing faction today. Uh, it isn't fundamentally about farm versus food, it's that both uh, were targets uh, for, uh, for cuts. Those are still the same political realities that we're working with today. Now, another big category to talk about in the farm bill is the food portion or the nutrition title. And if we did any sort of quiz here, I'd ask you which is the biggest title in the farm bill and the answer is nutrition. And then I'd ask you how big is it? And the current answer is nutrition title alone is about 86% of the total farm bill spending projected over the next 10 years. That's how big a question it is. Part of the issue about nutrition is the growing participation in SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This is the run up to the 2018 Farm Bill, but I can tell you where the numbers go from here uh, as well. Uh, the blue line represents million participants in the SNAP program. And it's grown from a pilot program in the 1960s to a 40 to 50 million participant program uh, post uh, the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. And again, amidst uh, or amid the, the COVID pandemic of uh, 2021 and, and into 2022. Uh, that participation rates mean dramatically higher uh, spending levels. Now, theoretically, SNAP is this temporary assistance program that helps producers, excuse me, helps consumers during uh, downward uh, shifts in the economy. Well, you can identify the economic downturns by higher unemployment rates in red, and by the official reset economic recessions, the gray bars. And you can find that participation shoots up dramatically in those periods, as you would expect it to do. You can also find that participation tends to only fall back gradually as consumers, as fat households get back to work, as economic conditions improve, uh, as benefits expire over time. Well, in the midst of COVID again, uh, numbers here uh, in the next chart, substantial increases in uh, participation during COVID and substantial increases in the benefit calculations mean uh, substantial increases in, in total spending. And SNAP spending has gone up dramatically. It's not going down nearly as quickly 
in a post-COVID uh, stronger economy sort of uh, framework. And so that's a sort of an overriding budgetary factor that drives part of the farm bill debate that we're going through. Now, there's reason to say here that maybe COVID is sort of miscategorized and food assistance in general might be miscategorized. Uh, some of this is about uh, reductions to unemployment, or excuse me, some of this is about additional assistance in the, amid high unemployment or amid economic uh, stress. Uh, that's when SNAP participation sort of tracks the economic cycles and the unemployment numbers. But SNAP participation also seems to track the poverty line fairly closely as well. And so some of this is about what's the role of SNAP? Is it temporary assistance or is it really a longer term poverty uh, program as well? That drives some of the political changes and some of the tenor of the debate, even this week, even yesterday, when the secretary was testifying before uh, Ag Committee and questions about SNAP and questions about the increased uh, benefit calculation uh, that USDA had implemented, uh, there are clearly stakeholders for higher SNAP spending that will argue against any proposals to dramatically reduce it. And that's a budgetary question that we'll face in this farm bill. Now, one more question about food policy here. Uh, it's just a reminder that it's not all about food assistance and SNAP. It's about everything else. This doesn't always get addressed in a farm bill, but it's always overriding some of the fundamental debate that we have. Uh, the chart on the right really does paint the picture, uh, maybe in the most stark uh, terms. The chart on the right is of the of quintiles of U.S. households, the bottom 20% to the top 20%. The bottom 20% spend a little over $4,000 a year on food. Now, I believe in addition to the food assistance and, and uh, uh, some of the food benefits, the food assistance benefits they receive, but the bottom 20% of households are spending about $4,000 on food. That represents more than 35% of their disposable income. They're spending a third of their income on food. In a US economy where on average, we spend a little bit less than 10% of our income on food, the bottom 20% spend more than a third of their income on food. They fundamentally are impacted by this food security debate and the SNAP program. The top 20%, they spend in excess of $14,000 a year on food, but it only represents about seven to 8% of their disposable income. The top 20% have the luxury of spending what they want on food with relatively little uh, reflection or maybe little uh, sensitivity to price. They're the drivers of policy discussions about where we grow our food, how we grow our food, what methods we use to grow our food, and so forth. There is simultaneously the debate between what a farm bill does for the bottom end in terms of food security and what it might include in terms of policy directions for the top end in terms of the demand, the attributes that they demand out of the food system. That was the sort of foodie versus neo foodie. Uh, uh, delineation in those political groupings earlier that I, that I showed you but didn't talk about at the time. The foodie, is, the traditional foodie is fighting for food security and they're going to fight against any proposed changes to SNAP. The neo-foodie is making a counter argument that food in fact is too cheap because it doesn't include all these attributes that we want or include all the, the, the demands on the food system that, that we want. And so there's, there's two simultaneous debates going on there that will cloud uh, the, the debate here on the farm bill as well. All right, a little bit on conservation and energy. Uh, another important component for producers and, and landowners, uh, wrapping up the voluntary conservation programs that show up in Title II, as well as some of the energy programs, but maybe the broader energy picture that, that drives the farm economy as well. If we think about conservation programs, we think about voluntary programs that, that show up in Title II. Of course, agriculture is also focused on where we stand with environmental regulations, requirements uh, or sticks instead of carrots. And we're also focused on what the market might even provide as an opportunity in terms of climate 
uh, change or climate practices and, uh, and potential carbon credits and other environmental credits. The investments in conservation have grown dramatically over the past several decades from the 85 Farm Bill and the introduction of the Conservation Reserve Program to the 1996 Farm Bill, particularly in the introduction of EQIP, CSP in the 2002 Farm Bill originally and revisions since, dramatic dollars in working lands programs uh, and substantial dollars in the Conservation Reserve Program as well. Uh, there are really fundamental different approaches here to think about conservation policy. And a lot of this is tied to how we manage farm bills. Conservation compliance provisions in farm bills are tied to, you must do these things. You must qualify uh, by doing good practices in order to receive farm bill benefits. Commodity program benefits, conservation program benefits, crop insurance program benefits, among others. That's the compliance provisions that the farm bill helps deliver. The farm bill also fundamentally delivers us the conservation title uh, with, with the retirement programs like CRP, but increasingly the working lands programs like EQIP and CSP, and now even the grasslands provision of CRP. Those are all critical components that the farm bill helps to, to provide. And then there's the market out there as well. Uh, other opportunities not necessarily addressed in the farm bill, but maybe through additional uh, legislation like, like some of the climate legislation that help define what the markets are and, and how they might work. So I'm back to the discussion of, of the sort of the political outlook here. And I talked briefly about the, the, uh, the conservationists versus the environmentalists or the environmental dealers versus the no dealers. I've talked more uh, recently about the, the foodie and the neo foodie. All of those groups want to play a part at the farm bill. It's not just the farm community that drives the farm bill debate. Uh, it is certainly a much bigger debate than it, than it historically was. In 2014, that gave us this kind of a farm bill, a safety net that gradually shifted more towards revenue and more towards a risk management type approach like crop insurance, trade that mattered for certain commodities, nutrition assistance that, that bar none is the most important component to getting the farm bill across the finish line. There was a fight in 2014 about cuts to nutrition Ultimately, the 2014 Farm Bill uh, failed on the floor of the House in a vote before it was resuscitated, uh, combined and compromised with the Senate version and passed. Everything else, commodities, conservation, crop insurance, uh, nutrition, those four categories account for more than 99% of the Farm Bill. Everything else just sort of rides along. It's important, it's critical, it still rides along. In 2018, same sort of discussion, but in the midst of a downturn instead of a coming off of record prices. In the midst of a downturn, it was like, just maintain the status quo. Try and keep the safety net intact. Uh, try and build back what we can. And that actually happened in dairy and cotton. Uh, nutrition still trumped everything else. The 14 Farm Bill died on the floor uh, of, of the House over a nutrition uh, cut. The 18 Farm Bill died on the floor of the House over proposed nutrition cuts. Ultimately, they were both brought back and compromised with a Senate version that was much more modest in what it proposed to do relative to any sort of nutrition cuts. Uh, ultimately, the 18 Farm Bill ended up being very status quo. Uh, give, us, give us what we've already got and we'll move forward. That leaves us to think about what's ahead for the 23 Farm Bill here with a few more slides. It, economics does matter. We're at higher farm income levels, we're at higher price levels, which leave us to worrying about whether the safety net's sufficient to protect us from the risk. Uh, but uh, if, if we propose any changes, they cost money and the budget really matters as well. The trade arena always matters in the sense of it does limit us to some of our choices. Uh, and occasionally it does have an impact on what we do. Uh, and the political arena certainly matters. Uh, the midterm elections uh, gave us new leadership, uh, new control of the house that changed perhaps some of the priorities and some of the directions that we are likely to go with this farm bill. The big question 
really is the budget. In 2018, the Farm Bill was projected to cost around $870 billion over 10 years. It's a five-year Farm Bill, most are, uh, but you measure them over a 10-year budget horizon. In 2018, the Farm Bill was projected to cost around $870 billion, of which nutrition was more than three-fourths. In 2023, the Congressional Budget Office released its baseline uh, in February, and the projected cost of current programs going forward is more than $1.4 trillion, of which more than 80%, almost 85 or 86% is nutrition. It's not that other programs have gotten smaller. There is a typo here. The commodity programs did not actually shrink to seven. I think they shrunk to 57. Um, so I somehow missed a number in there, my apologies. Uh, commodities are largely flat in spending levels. Conservation is largely flat in spending levels, at least on budget. Crop insurance is up at the moment because prices are up, which means premiums are up, which means uh, uh, the premium subsidies. But fundamentally, it's nutrition that's gone through the roof. And that will lead the debate. We're likely to have the same debate again that we had in 14 and 18 we may very well likely have the same sort of conclusion uh, where we uh, fight over it and then ultimately come out with a compromise that keeps it intact. But that's a real debate that, that we have before us. That's the budget challenge. There are two other really big tests of the budget that are worth mentioning. And one is ad hoc assistance. Since 2018, and the introduction of the market facilitation program payment as a form of trade assistance amid the Trump trade wars, we have substantially ramped up ad hoc assistance to producers. We do have standing disaster assistance programs, the livestock indemnity program, the livestock forage disaster program, the emergency livestock assistance program, uh, the tree assistance program is the other one. Those four programs do provide relief when conditions uh, warrant, either due to drought or due to uh, extreme uh, disaster events. Um, those were authorized with permanent authority in the 14 Farm Bill and they continue. But it's the ad hoc programs in the rest of the list, from trade payments to disaster payments to coronavirus uh, assistance payments and on and on and on that have given us dramatically more spending on an ad hoc basis. If you look at that chart, the yellow bar down here at the bottom in uh, 2020, that was commodity program spending. That was the green bar was conservation spending. The dark uh, red or orange bars there were ad hoc and, and supplemental payments. Ad hoc payments overwhelmed the rest of the farm bill. And as we see payments ramped down substantially into 21, 22, and 23, we still see ad hoc payments are dramatically bigger than underlying commodity program payments. In other words, what does a commodity program look like when we've been spending more dollars in an ad hoc fashion than we have in a traditional program fashion? That's a big question for the year. Those ad hoc programs, by the way, don't come with new budget authority. And so uh, this debate about where should we go with, with the budget, will we find new money? Well, it's not coming from ad hoc spending. The need may be there, but the, the budget's not. That's the, that's the commodity program versus ad hoc program side. One more uh, chart to reinforce that is on the conservation side. Conservation spending on the working lands programs of EQIP and CSP, uh, as well as the Ag Conservation Easement Program and the Regional uh, Conservation Partnership Program. Those programs together have grown to about a $4 billion baseline. Uh, year in, year out, over the next decade. That was the projection in, uh, in the, the long run budget projections. Uh, that's everything in conservation really, except for the CRP, which is about another 2 billion in its own right. But to go from roughly a $4 billion baseline to pumping in an extra $20 billion of spending in the Inflation Reduction Act, all authorization that was pumped in over the next four years, 23 through 26, 
with spending that is projected to take the better part of the next decade. Um, that is a dramatic increase in what conservation programs are currently doing, but it is not a permanent increase in budget authority. Uh, that spending, as per the reconciliation instructions, that spending has to wrap up within a decade. That authority can't continue past, uh, uh, past 2032. So the challenge is we're spending lots of additional money in disaster assistance. We're currently spending lots of additional money in conservation, but we don't have that same money to allocate to a new farm bill. We have to make some budget choices or we'll have to make some, some compromises to, to see that come to pass. So I'll leave it with that. And this is the final slide. The challenge here to try and write a 2023 farm bill is what's the role of the safety net? Do we need to ramp it up to protect risk under higher price levels at the present time? Or do we uh, uh, face the reality that any sort of increases in the safety net costs money and that may or may not be available? The same debate could be added to ask about conservation. Lots of temporary money right now, no real promise that, that's the, that that is money that can last. Uh, lots of temporary money focused specifically on climate, questions about the balance of, of climate initiatives versus the rest of the conservation programs uh, to come. A focus on food assistance, uh, a focus on SNAP particularly, uh, I suspect that will be a really contentious debate. Uh, I don't know that it will result in dramatic changes if we are to ever get to the finish line on the farm bill. There are other categories, rural development where broadband remains a priority. There was also dramatic increases in broadband spending in the infrastructure language, infrastructure legislation. So trying to figure out longer priorities from short run uh, ad hoc uh, funding decisions is one of the real questions for the year. And the last up there is just a reminder that this farm bill is not just about large scale commodity agriculture. It's also about uh, the large and the small, as was debated yesterday in committee. It's also about those that have traditionally been underserved, uh, many of our uh, minority audiences that have participated in farm programs, but maybe have, have, have been uh, uh, discriminated or at least traditionally uh, underserved relative to other producers. Those are all priorities. Those are all topics of discussion. They all leave us with big questions about whether we can or, and, and when we might actually get a, 20, uh, a 2023 farm bill. So as I said, I'll leave it with that. I'll return to the, uh, the picture mode here and, and uh, invite any follow-up discussion and questions.